Over the years, audiences have been captivated by the tale of Lady Jane Grey, a young girl caught up in the political strife of her day. Was she a martyr, a helpless victim, or some other kind of complicated character born out of Tudor's desires, including her own? Was Lady Jane Grey of England a victim of the men scheming around her? Or did she die innocent as a voluntary Protestant martyr? Lady Jane Grey served as queen for only nine days in an attempt to block Mary Tudor, a Catholic, from becoming queen. Lady Jane Grey was born sometime in autumn of 1537. She was well educated in humanities and was regarded as one of the most intelligent young women of her day. Jane had a strict but excellent education at home, just like other girls in her situation. She studied French, Italian, and classical languages including Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And she was introduced to Protestantism through her father and tutors. Jane was a committed student who liked reading Plato rather than participating in sports or going hunting. Why did Princess Mary order Jane to be executed at just 17 years old? I hope you're ready for some family drama, treason, and executions, because this is a hell of a story, which in modern time, we can't even imagine things like this happening. Watch till the end to see how it all ended. From the beginning, Lady Jane Grey was the eldest daughter of Henry Grey, the first Duke of Suffolk, and his wife, Frances. Frances was the eldest daughter of Henry VIII's younger sister, Mary. Jane had two younger sisters, Lady Catherine and Lady Mary. Through their mother, the three sisters were great-granddaughters of Henry VII, great-nieces of Henry VIII, and first cousins once removed of Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I. Jane was educated in the humanities by John Aylmer, learning Latin and Greek at a young age as well as studying Hebrew and Italian with Michelangelo Florio. She committed herself to becoming a Protestant under the guidance of her father and her teachers. And she also maintained a correspondence with the Zurich reformer, Heinrich Bullinger. At 10 years old, in the spring of 1547, she was assigned to Thomas Seymour's home. Aristocratic children were frequently raised in other homes during the Tudor era especially if the Foster family had a better social standing. The children gained etiquette knowledge and were better equipped to choose a compatible patron or find love. Although he was a close family friend and the late sister of Jane Seymour, Henry VIII's third wife, Thomas Seymour, was also Edward VI's uncle. Thomas, who was ambitious, realized that influencing Jane could be very profitable. Although Jane and Edward were still young children, Thomas had intended to marry Jane to the king after they had grown up. Matchmaking Did you know fostering aristocratic offspring increased a family's power and wealth? Because matchmaking was lucrative. In 1547, Thomas Seymour wed Catherine Parr, the widow of Henry VIII. Henry's children were close to Catherine, who personally oversaw their schooling. She was a devout Protestant, a scholar, and a supporter of the performing and visual arts. She made sure that her stepchildren and Lady Jane Grey, who developed into an educated, sophisticated, and devout young woman, knew about these interests. Jane was taken home after Catherine tragically passed away in delivery in September 1548. At Catherine Parr's funeral, Lady Jane served as the principal mourner. Thomas Seymour continued to express interest in keeping Lady Jane in his home, and she visited him there again for about two months, until he was detained at the end of 1548. The popularity of Thomas with the young King Edward made Seymour's brother, the Lord Protector Edward Seymour, first Duke of Somerset, feel threatened. Thomas Seymour was accused of making the King's bridal proposal to Jane, among other things. Jane's father was fortunate to stay mainly out of trouble during Thomas Seymour's subsequent attainder and execution. After being questioned by the king's council four times, he suggested his daughter Jane as the wife of Lord Hertford, the protector's oldest son. However, nothing of the sort transpired, 
and Jane was not given in marriage until May 25, 1553, to Lord Guildford Dudley, the younger son of John Dudley, the first Duke of Northumberland. The Duke, Lord President of the King's Council, beginning in late 1549, was at the time the dominant figure in the nation. The couple wed on May 25, 1553, in a triple wedding at Durham House, where Jane's sister Catherine was paired with Lord Herbert, the heir of the Earl of Pembroke. And another Catherine, the sister of Lord Guildford, was paired with Henry Hastings, the Earl of Huntingdon's heir. Because Jane was a devout Protestant and would support the Reformed Church of England, whose foundation Edward lay, and because his half-sister Mary was a Catholic, Edward VI named Jane and her male heirs as the successors to the crown in his will, which was written in June 1553. Because of their illegitimacy, the will disregarded Mary and Elizabeth, his half-sisters, and their claims under the Third Succession Act. On July 6, 1553, when he was just 15 years old, Edward VI's brief but dramatic reign came to an early end. On Sunday, July 9th, Jane received a summons to her father-in-law's home in London, the Scion House, where she was informed that, by Edward's instructions, she would immediately be proclaimed queen. The privy councillors who knelt before Lady Jane to take the oath of allegiance appeared to be quite surprised by this as she grew very upset and looked puzzled and embarrassed. Make sure to subscribe to History Flicks and hit the bell icon so you won't miss any of our future history updates. Chosen Queen Jane was chosen queen on July 10th, 1553, following Edward's passing, and she awaited her coronation in the Tower of London. Until her parents and husband showed up, Lady Jane was not going to be calmed. According to Jane's later account of the incident, declaring to them my inefficiency, I greatly bewailed myself for the death of such a noble prince, and at the same time, turned myself to God, humbly praying and beseeching him that, if what was given to me was rightfully and lawfully mine, his divine majesty would grant me such grace and spirit, that I might govern it to his glory and service, and the benefit of this realm." A canopy was being carried over Jane's head as she approached the tower. Guildford was standing next to her, dressed in white and gold. Everything appeared to be going according to plan, until Jane was asked to wear the crown. She declined and recalls being told she may accept it fearlessly, and that another should also be fashioned, crown my husband, which, for my part, I heard honestly with a troubled mind, malice, even with endless sadness and disgust of heart. Jane would not issue a proclamation of Guildford as king without a parliamentary act. To her mother-in-law, the chagrin instead made him Duke of Clarence. Jane's reign came to an end before she could resolve the problems with her husband. The oldest daughter of Henry VIII, her cousin Princess Mary, demanded to be made queen in a letter to the Privy Council. The members of the council the Archbishop of Canterbury, and numerous other strong men badly miscalculated the magnitude of the Catholic princess's base of support. In a unified response, they supported Jane and advised the princess to be calm and obedient. But Mary was her father's daughter, a princess who enjoyed wide public support as the legitimate heir to the throne. The majority of Jane's supporters turned against her, as Mary's popularity surged swiftly. On July 19, 1553, the Privy Council of England abruptly switched sides, deposing Jane and announcing Mary as Queen. Jane and her husband were both locked up on July 19, 1553, in the Beauchamp Tower and the gentlemen's jailer's rooms of the tower. On August 22, 1553, her father-in-law, the Duke of Northumberland, who was her main ally, was charged with treason and executed less than a month later. Parliament recognized Mary as the legitimate heir in September and canceled Jane's declaration as an act of theft. Imprisoned After being imprisoned in the tower, Jane was found guilty of high treason in November 1553 and given the death penalty.
Jane was first spared by Mary, but as soon as her father, Henry Grey, first Duke of Suffolk, joined Wyatt's uprising against the monarchy's plan to wed Philip II of Spain, Jane started to be seen as a threat to the crown. Jane Dudley, referred to by the court as Guildford's wife, was accused of high treason, along with her husband, two of his brothers, and Thomas Cranmer, a former Archbishop of Canterbury. On November 13, 1553, a special commission heard their case in Guildhall, in the city of London. Thomas Howard, the third Duke of Norfolk, and Sir Thomas White, the Lord Mayor of London, served as the commission's co-chairman. John Borchier, the second Earl of Bath, and Edward Stanley, the third Earl of Derby, were additional members. All defendants received death sentences after being found guilty, as was to be expected. Several documents that Jane had signed under the name of Jane the Queen served as proof of her guilt for treacherously assuming the title and authority of the monarch. Be burnt alive on Tower Hill or beheaded as the Queen pleases was the punishment given to her. Her life will be spared, the imperial diplomat informed Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. Jane's destiny was sealed by Thomas Wyatt the Younger's uprising in January 1554 against Queen Mary's intentions to wed Philip of Spain. Due to the involvement of her father, Henry Grey, 1st Duke of Suffolk, and his two brothers in the uprising, the government chose to uphold the judgment against Jane and Guildford. Originally set for February 9, 1554, their execution was then delayed by three days to give Jane time to renounce her Protestant faith. John Feckenham, Mary's chaplain, was sent to Jane, who at first was not happy about it. She got acquainted with him and permitted him to accompany her to the scaffold, even though she refused to give in to his attempts to save her soul. The authorities transported Guildford from his Tower of London lodgings to the public execution site at Tower Hill on the morning of February 12, 1554, when he was decapitated. His remains were returned to the tower by horse and cart, passing Jane's lodgings. When Jane turned around to see her husband's corpse again, she reportedly said, Oh, Guildford, Guildford. She was then brought outside to Tower Green, where she was decapitated. Jane delivered a speech as she ascended the scaffold. She admitted to doing something that was deemed illegal, but said, I do wash my hands therefrom in innocent. After reciting Psalm 51, Jane gave her maid her gloves and a handkerchief. She gave him her forgiveness after he begged for it and said, I pray you dispatch me fast. Will you take that off before I lay me down, she requested, pointing to her head, to which the axeman replied, No, lady. She then covered her eyes. When Jane was unable to use her hands to find the block, she sobbed. So what do I do? Where is it? She most likely received assistance navigating from Sir Thomas Bridges, the deputy lieutenant of the tower. Jane uttered the final words of Jesus, as recorded by Luke while her head was on the block. Lord, into thine hands I surrender my spirit. The axe then landed with a single, precise blow. On the north side of Tower Green, in the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula, lie the graves of Jane and Guildford. There was no monument placed over their burial. On February 23, 1554, the Duke of Suffolk, Jane's father, was put to death. On March 1555, her mother, the Duchess of Suffolk, wed Adrian Stokes, her master of the horse and chamberlain. Mary granted her a complete pardon and gave her permission to reside in court with her two surviving daughters. In 1559, she died. With so little surviving evidence, Perhaps we will never know the reasons why this happened to Lady Jane Grey. If you like this, subscribe to our channel and explore more history and mystery with us. Thank you for watching this video, and don't forget to let us know what you would like to see on History Flicks, and tell us what you think about this video in the comments section. If you like this one, check out our others on History Flicks. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.